So as I've mentioned, um, compassion seems to be at the forefront of my focus on my retreat so far. And the instigator of this has been Lama Zopa, his beautiful book, Ultimate Healing, The Power of Compassion. And it all started with compassion is the source of happiness in life. It is the essential means of ensuring our own happiness, the happiness of society. Without loving kindness and compassion, there is no peace or happiness in family, society, the country, or the world. It is the source of a healthy mind, healthy body. It is the most powerful way to heal ourselves and to heal other living beings. That's the instigator. And as Venerable had said two weeks ago, she said, this is not an easy undertaking. Good old first link of the 12 links makes sure that this is just a hard undertaking. As long as we believe in this inherently existent self is most important and that its happiness is most important and its suffering needs to be alleviated immediately, if not sooner, and that all those other inherently existent sentient beings' happiness and suffering is not so important. We've got a problem. It's going to be hard. So what I ended up doing is going back to some with Lama Zopa's continual encouragement is to go back to three principal things that I've been trying to do to level the field for myself to be able to cultivate this. The first one is, just like me, all sentient beings want happiness and its causes. Just like me, all sentient beings, without exception, want to be free of suffering and its causes. Now, I don't know about you, but I've heard these two statements at least a thousand times, 1,200 times. Every one of my teachers says it almost every time they set a motivation. Do I believe it? Do I believe them? And I have a reality check that I've tested in the past few weeks. Any time that I get reactive, any time an affliction arises, they're not playing in my mind. Because what I'm really saying is, I know you want happiness. It's so great that you want happiness. And I really, really want you to not suffer. But you know, my happiness is just a little itty, itty, itty more important than yours. And the alleviation of my suffering is a tiny, tiny bit more crucial than alleviating yours. And right now you're interfering with my happiness and causing problems. Stop it. Cut it out. <laughs> and what makes it even more challenging is every... And it's because the whole, this whole construct of the inherently existent I all day long, self-promotion, self-preservation, self-obsession, self-absorption, self-concern, self-pity, self-defense. There's nowhere to be able to even think about the happiness of others and the suffering to alleviate that. And to make it even more complicated, every sentient being out there without exception, because they also have constructed this, this inherently existent I due to the self-grasping, has the same level of self-promotion, self-defense, you know, self-concern, self um, self -concern, self absorption self-obsession, self-interest, self-referencing. Can you feel the tension? on how are we going to do that for each other. We can't. Because they have the same habits since beginning of this time, that the inherently existent I is the ruler of the universe. And that is the priority for everybody to take care of that I. And as Mar Marshall Ro Rosenberg has said beautifully, is that he says, this is a tragic attempt to get our needs met to get the need for happiness met and to the need to eliminate suffering. And what we do instead, because of this first link, is we run pell-mell into suffering. Venerable has said this over and over again. We run away from the causes of happiness over and over again. So it's very important, at least my mind has found, I have to say, just like me. 
I cannot leave that out. That will never, ever level the field unless I say, just like me, every living being without exception wants happiness and wants to avoid suffering. And so one of the ways that I've been trying to get out of myself, because one of the things that's very interesting is I can't take my mind off myself for more than five or 10 minutes. It showed up in the kitchen yesterday. You know, putting together a lunch for 30 people in an hour and a half takes some doing. And I can do it. But I sure was looking for a little bit of praise. They're going to think I'm competent. They're going to think I'm great. They're going to love the lunch. Forget about the prayer that says I'm cooking for the community of Dharma practitioners. All the love I put into it will nourish their hearts. I want some praise. <laughs> Forget about Sin and, and Karen, who've been you know, helping unbelievably in the past three weeks. It's 15 minutes I can do, maybe, for others. But it all turns back to, I, I'm thinking about me. My mind turns to me all the time. And this is the mind I've got to work with. So then the third one that I'm trying to, to work with to cultivate this beautiful mind of compassion is I keep going back to Geshe Topke's uh, explanation of the middle scope, this whole thing about taking on these aggregates. All five aggregates are a certainty. It is certain that we are going to experience the three types of dukkha. And what I say to myself is just like me, there is no sentient being without exception. Due to the self-grasping ignorance, this grasping by this craving itself at the time of death propels them yet to take yet another set of their own set of five polluted aggregates. Just like me. They may look different. The karma may be different. The body might be different. The reason is the same. Whether they're furred, feathered, two-legged, four-legged, they got money, they got no money, they got scales, they got shells, all of them have been propelled by afflictions and polluted karma to take on the five aggregates. And that you can guarantee the five, the three types of dukkha are going to show up in their lives as well. So once again, trying to put myself in just like me, they're going through this. And to make it even more difficult, is even that little spider and Jeff Bezos and anybody else in the realms are also starting the 12 links every moment of their existence. Form, feeling, discrimination, compositional, miscellaneous factors in consciousness. There isn't any sentient being that has an uncontrolled rebirth that is not turning these, starting these 12 links in the course of their existence, just like me propelled by afflictions and polluted karma. They don't pass go, they don't collect $200. But, and what happened in the middle of one of these meditations this week, I've been looking, thinking of this for three weeks now, is I started to cry. Because I, and the word that came up for me was kinship. Same tribe, same pack, same family, same flock. We're all in this together. There's no difference. There is a kinship that is inseparable. Can't get away from it. We gotta own it. We gotta love it. We gotta appreciate it. We are together in this. Yet, Without being arrogant or without being pry, proud, there is a fundamental difference. Although we're trapped in cyclic existence with these polluted aggregates, we've got the precious human life. We have met the Dharma. We have interest. We have qualified Mayana, Vajrayana teachers. We have good friends, a rarefied environment, interest, a roof over our heads, good wits about us. And so even though we've got the five aggregates, we can go, what am I going to do with this form today? How am I going to choose what to do when I have a pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral feeling come up? How am I going to use my wisdom and my bodhicitta to decide what to cultivate and what to abandon? And as far as that grab bag of miscellaneous factors, I've got ethical conduct, generosity, choice, effort, love, and kindness, concentration, wisdom. 
anything I want. I've got the Dharma to help me guide, build that grab bag of a whole lot of virtue. And that mental consciousness, even though it's still polluted karma, when I, cr- I want to make sure when I create virtue, the object, the intention, the action, the completion are all within the realm of bodhicitta. So if I'm going to put a seed on that consciousness, it's going to be a good one. I'll still be in samsara, but I'm going to get myself a precious human life again. This is the power of a precious human life. So although, and, with, and so it brings up in me this incredible humility. Oh my God, incredible responsibility. This is like we are in the palm of the universe's hand for what we have, folks. Cons- compared to what every other sentient being has in the realms. We're maybe on the head of a pin. Forget about the palm of a hand. How about the head of a pin? And the medicine Buddha practice is just yet another way to be able to make these decisions, these choices, to deal with these five polluted aggregates that we've got, to make use of them, and to always surround it and imbue it with bodhicitta. Now, I've been hanging around with Lama Zopa for three weeks. That's why I talk like this now. <laughs> so we're all in this together, and compassion is a beautiful, beautiful mental factor. I have found this to be extremely helpful. That whole happiness, who's got happiness, who wants suffering, has totally changed after my 1500th time I've heard it. I'm actually starting to understand what it means. So I hope this has been helpful.